the week of St. Valentine's Day. The legend is, as we just heard, that Valentine had such compassion or love for young couples under his care that he defied the Roman emperor and performed marriage ceremonies for them. Rome wanted the young men for soldiers, not husbands. And according to the story, Valentine was jailed and then executed for his defiance. Valentine risked and lost his life in order to follow his conscience. There are still those today willing to take risks for love and conscience. A United Methodist minister from my hometown of Lebanon, Pennsylvania, was defrocked in 2013 for performing a marriage ceremony for his son. NPR reported in June of 2014 that he was reinstated. They reported that a Methodist minister in Pennsylvania who was defrocked last year for presiding over his son's same-sex wedding has been reinstated by the church. A nine-person appeals panel of the United Methodist Church ordered Frank Schaefer's pastoral credentials restored, saying the jury that convicted him last year erred when fashioning his punishment, according to the Associated Press. Schaefer said, I have devoted my life to this church, to serving this church, and to be restored and to be able to call myself a reverend again and speak with this voice means so much to me. He said he intends to work for gay rights with an even stronger voice from within the United Methodist Church. Now, Schaefer's not the only one in that fight, and it continues. In April of last year, the Religion News Service reported that when Marty and Miles Ferro were married in January in Tupelo, Mississippi, the celebration of communion was especially important to Maddie. The United Methodist Church practices an open table, inviting everyone to receive the bread and wine. To Maddie, 23, it's a connection with both God and the people around them. It's one of the things that drew them to Methodism. <laughs> The wedding was everything we wanted, said Miles, who's 24. And then came the complaint. The two United Methodist ministers who co-officiated the Caffaro's wedding, the Reverend Paige Swain Presley and the Reverend Elizabeth Davison, say they were informed in late February that a formal complaint had been filed against them, allegedly for officiating a same-sex wedding. They told Religion News Service that they have been asked to surrender their clergy credentials or face a church trial in the Mississippi Conference of the United Methodist Church. But Maddie and Miles identify as non-binary. And Swain Presley and Davidson say the United Methodist Book of Discipline is silent on the topic of wedding between two non-binary people while on other matters, it directs deacons and elders to act according to their conscience. In a paragraph about civil disobedience, the Book of Discipline recognizes the right of individuals to dissent when acting under the constraint of conscience. These ministers aren't risking their lives, but they are risking their livelihoods in order to do what love and conscience tells them is right. No Unitarian Universalist minister is going to risk anything within this denomination by officiating at weddings for any couple. But we may have other risks we need to take for love. On Monday this week, Timothy Snyder, a history professor at Yale University, was interviewed by Meghna Chakrabarty on the show On Point on National Public Radio. Snyder said, democracy is rare. Democracy is hard. And people who have seen democracy be challenged or collapsed become very thoughtful about that. And so there's a tradition. And the United States takes part in that tradition of having a kind of constitutional moment of reflection where one recognizes that the horizon is not always bright and open, that there can be challenges, and that 
as a response to those challenges, a constitution has to be able to defend itself. What happened in the United States between 1861 and 1865 was one of many world historical challenges to the principle of democracy. This is why Lincoln's speech at Gettysburg is so famous. Government of, by, and for the people is coined as a response to that challenge to democracy. And Lincoln's trying to define what democracy is. Historically speaking, philosophically speaking, the alternative to the rule of law is the rule of fear. Chakrabarty noted that fear is currently right in America and that some are saying certain things shouldn't be done in defense of democracy because if they are, there might be a violent response from some people. Snyder responds by saying, I want to say very clearly that everybody who makes an argument out of that motivation is taking part in an authoritarian transition. That is exactly how you move away from having the rule of law to having the rule of fear when you anticipate that the other side is going to use violence and you concede in advance. Democracy requires being there for one another, having care, May I even say, love for one another. Government of, by, and for the people means that people need to stand up for, stand by, and stand with one another. Perhaps you know the quote attributed to the 20th century German Lutheran pastor, Martin Niemöller a page on the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum website notes that Martin Niebuhr was a prominent Lutheran pastor in Germany. In the 1920s and 30s, he sympathized with many Nazi ideas and supported radically right-wing political movements. But after Adolf Hitler came to power in 1933, Niemöller became an outspoken critic of Hitler's interference in the Protestant church. He spent the last eight years of Nazi rule from 1937 to 1945 in Nazi prisons and concentration camps. You likely know the quote attributed to him. First they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out, because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Today in our nation, some are erasing black history. Are we speaking out? Some are taking away reproductive rights. Are we making our voices heard? Some are rolling back rights for people who identify as transgender. What, if anything, are we saying? All it took for slavery to remain in the South for as long as it did, and for Jim Crow to come in after slavery and remain for another century, was the silence of people who thought it was wrong. Yes, it was fear that kept many silent, and there was reason to fear. 41 names are inscribed on the Civil Rights Memorial in Montgomery, Alabama, sponsored by the Southern Poverty Law Center. 41, and that's not all, but 41 martyrs to the cause. Most of the people named there identified as black. But on that memorial, there are names of two white Unitarian Universalists, Viola Liuso and James Reed. They and others 
put love before fear. And they paid the price. What enabled Hitler to oversee the atrocity of the Holocaust? The fear that kept people silent. The state of Israel uses the term the righteous among the nations to refer to non-Jews who for totally altruistic reasons work to save their Jewish neighbors from the Nazis. Not all those who helped survived. There were good reasons to fear. But remember the words of Professor Snyder. I want to say very clearly that everybody who makes an argument out of that motivation, fear, is taking part in an authoritarian transition. That is exactly how you move away from having the rule of law to having the rule of fear. When you anticipate that the other side is going to use violence and you concede in advance. Nelson Mandela, the South African anti-apartheid activist who served as the first president of South Africa after apartheid, said, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave person is not the one who does not feel afraid, but the one who conquers that fear. St. Valentine, we are told, sent a note to his jailer's daughter before he was executed. Signed, your Valentine. His name means strong, filled with valor. This St. Valentine's Day, don't let it be all about chocolates and teddy bears. May we each be someone's valentine in the sense of the strong, valiant person who will be there for them and not be silent. In May of last year, Reverend Lee Kinvey wrote this piece for the weekly Unitarian Universalist Braver, Wiser email. It is my favorite UU email because it is not about the administration, but about people's personal stories. Kinvey begins with this quote. Let me say right now for the record, I'm still gonna be here asking this world to dance, even if it keeps stepping on my holy feet. Andrea Gibson in their poem, The Nutritionist. Kinvey then writes, they told me I was a girl when I was born. And every day after that, I tried so hard to be that for so long. But I've been out of place in women's bathrooms my whole life. It's usually the gasp, the horrified stare, the obvious double checking the sign on the door. Sometimes it's what are you doing in here? Or get the hell out of the women's bathroom. A dozen times I've been physically handled, shoved out the door, or groped roughly by women trying to prove their point. Entering a sex-segregated bathroom requires courage every single time. My heart races, my mouth dries out. I lower my head, move as fast as I can, pitch my voice high if I have to speak. Although I'm clear it doesn't work, I try to put an emotional armor in an attempt to protect myself. Last fall at a concert, I was preparing to use the bathroom, and when I saw the all-gender bathroom sign, I grinned wide and exhaled. And then, in the bathroom, a woman gave me that horrified stare I know so well and half screeched, this is the women's bathroom. This is actually an all gender bathroom, I responded, hoping we could end it there. I'm kind of glad I don't remember the rest, only that it hurt more than I thought that I, more than, it, that, mm, more than it hurt more because I thought I was safe. 
I went outside the rest of intermission and cried the tears I needed to cry. I'm grateful not to mind crying in public. My humanity is not up for debate and neither is yours, I imagine saying to the stranger in the bathroom. I also imagine saying, I wish for you the sensitivity and grace to take 10 seconds before you enter future bathrooms to remind yourself you could encounter someone non-binary or gender bendy. I invite you to remember how much courage it takes for them to be there at all. I invite you to simply assume that everyone in the bathroom knows where they are. Kinsey ends with a prayer. May we breathe into a moment of gently. May we miss whisper to each other of belonging, of I belong, and you belong, and we belong, just as we are. Amen. Be braver. Tell each other that we all belong. Tell the world that acts as though we don't, that we all belong. Happy Valentine's Day. Our closing hymn is 1021, Lean on Me. I invite you to stand.